Hello, this is Lainey of Limerick, and what I thought I would do is do a little something different. Um, normally you're so used to um, hearing some of my poetry and, and so forth, and what I thought I would do is um, read some excerpts from some books from my cousin James Hayes. And so... Um, the one I have here right now is called the Shamrock Scissor Sisters. And what I thought I would do is read you the teaser on the back of the book. And then I'm going to read a chapter to um, entice you even more. So, um, again, this is uh, a book that James wrote a while back. One of the many books he wrote. And so... Um, the title is what caught my attention uh, initially when I was looking through the different books that, that he wrote. And so, uh, here's the teaser on the back of the book. The doctor would treat Jackie right, or little sister would make him sorry. She would not necessarily have to kill him. She could just cut something off, something not vital, maybe an ear or two. She knew she should not think about doing those kind of things. The more she considered it, the more she had wanted to do it. Furthermore, eventually she would not be able to restrain herself. Nevertheless, Jackie should not even marry the man if he's worthless, she believed. There would be a bachelor party for the doctor. In this situation, she should be there to watch his behavior. Maybe she could be the stripper. She could pull it off with a good disguise. If someone was going to be hurt, it was not going to be her sister. When it came to family, all outside, it does not matter. She knows so many ways of killing. She was always ready to learn more. Wow. Very interesting. So now, we will read to you um, chapter 17 in the book. Jackie and Denise were finishing a lazy, late breakfast on the patio. Where did the old woman go with her nurse this morning? Denise asked. I don't know. Teresa rarely goes anywhere, said Jackie. Well, I saw them leave in a black car. Really, I can't imagine where they went. Still, I wonder why Susan did not drive the Mercedes. This is weird. It's just the two of us here alone in the house with Christy. Denise raised one eyebrow mischievously. And where is he anyway? I wanted him to pour me some more orange juice. She could get used to a life of luxury with people to run around behind her. I don't know. Nevertheless, I'm going to take a very long bubble bath, sis. Jackie got up from the table and walked away. You will turn into a prune. Denise went downstairs to her bedroom. She had been up since 6 a.m. The exercise room was right adjoining the TV room, just a few yards from her bedroom. She had been working out on one of the machines when she heard a car drive up to the house. The rooms along the front of the basement were mostly underground but had a high window facing the yard. Denise had looked out and seen Susan helping Teresa into the black car. After exercising, she had taken a shower, made a pot of coffee in the nearby pub room, and plopped down in the TV room to watch more TV while sipping her coffee. Later, Jackie had called her mobile and invited her to come up for a late breakfast. The two had sat around in their robes, eating and talking for an hour or so. Now it was afternoon, Time to get dressed. Denise did a slow strip tease in the mirror. What a nice tight body she had. Not bad for a 29-year-old, she thought. Any woman would be thrilled to have a body. Her body, or any man. She went to the closet, picked out a sexy outfit, and carried it to the bed. But as she walked past the dresser, she accidentally knocked something off. It was her favorite perfume. She cringed as it hit the wood floor, but the bottle did not break. It just fell on its side and began to roll. She noticed that the rolling sound changed as the bottle went under the bed, as though the flooring under there was different. She put her robe back on and knelt down to retrieve the perfume, which was halfway under the bed. Once she had picked up the bottle, she ran her hand across the flooring. It felt the same as the rest of the floor. She knocked on it. It sounded hollow. Then she tested the floor where she was sitting. It sounded solid. Denise's curiosity was revved up to a cat-like pitch. She did not know what she expected to find, but she could think of nothing else until she found out. 
She pushed with all her might until the heavy bed broke free and began to slide. She managed to move it over against the wall. Denise knocked on the floor in several places, identifying the hollow-sounding area, and then she went to her suitcase and pulled out a scissors and began to search for cracks in the seams of the flooring near the edge of the hollow rectangle. Finally she found one. She dug the scissors down into it and began to pry. She felt movement, not much, but enough to convince her self that she was looking at a sacred door. Something was hidden down there, something forbidden. She just had to find out what it was. And you're going to have to find out what it is by getting the book, because um, then you can find out what happens next. So again, this is the Shamrock Scissor Sisters, um, written by James Hayes. And we have another book here of his, which is uh, another one that I really like. And this one's called There Must Be a God for Gods. Now, the one thing I like about this book, it's a different format than the other one, which is a mystery type uh, novel. This is more of a, um, a personal type of uh, diary of um, feelings and emotions that um, the author was conveying at a certain point in his life and so um, I just love the, the style and the way it's written and so this is There Must Be a God for Gods by James Hayes and I'm just going to open up to any point in the book because of the, of the format it just you can do that um, it starts here on this page with those those who act uprightly are not rewarded, but they and their children often wander in the utmost need. Those who do evil are not always punished, but frequently flourish and have happy children. Rewards and punishments are purely human institutions, and if government were relaxed, they entirely disappear. No intelligence, whatever, interferes in human affairs. There is a most senseless belief now, widespread, that effort and work and cleverness, perseverance and industry are invariably successful. Was this the case every man would enjoy a capability at least, and be free from the cares of money? This is an illusion almost equal to the superstition of a directing intelligence, which every fact and every consideration disapproves. Or disproves I'm sorry um, and moving along to another area we 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 are born naked and not even protected by a hairy covering nothing is done for us the first and strongest command using the word to convey the idea only that nature, the cosmos, our own bodies give, is to do everything for us. And that's one thought. Uh, here's another. These. And what's uh, interesting with this book is the first word of the thought or the um, discussion is underlined. So these things speak with a voice of thunder from every human being whose body has been racked by pain from every human being who has suffered from misfortune or disease from every human being drowned burned or slain by negligence there goes up a continually increasing howl louder than the thunder an awe-inspiring cry dread to listen to which no one dares listen to, against which ears are stopped by the wax of superstition and the wax of criminal self-interest. These miseries are our own doing, because we have mind and though, and could have disallowed them. We can prevent them in the future. We do not even try. Lives spent in doing well have been lives nobly wasted. Everything is in vain. The circle of ideas we have is too limited to aid us. 
We need ideas as far outside our circle as ours are outside those that were pondered over by Caesar. That, that twelve thousand written years should have elapsed, and the human race able to reason and to think and easily capable of combination in huge armies for its own destruction, should still live from hand to mouth like cattle and sheep, like the animals of the field and the birds of the woods, that there should not even be roofs to cover the children born unless those children work and expend their time to pay for them, that there should not be clothes unless again time and work are expended to procure them, that there should not be even food for the children of the human race, except that they work as their fathers did twelve thousand years ago, that even water should scarce be accessible to them, unless paid for by work. In twelve thousand written years the world has not yet built itself a house, nor filled a granary, nor organized itself for its own comfort. It is so marvelous I cannot express the question with it which fills me, which it fills me. That, that selfishness has all to do with its, in, it I entirely deny. The human race for ages upon ages has been imprisoned by ignorance, and by the interested persons whose object it has been to confine the minds of men, thereby doing more injury than if with infected hands they purposely impose disease on the heads of the people. And then one more out of this book. Let me see. I'm going to skip around. The mind goes on and requires more than these, something higher than prayed, and even higher than a god. I have been thankful to write these things by a desire that has worked in me since early childhood in Nina. They have not been written for the sake of argument, still less for any thought of self-endorsement, rather indeed the reverse. They have been forced from me by the seriousness of my past, and they express my most serious convictions. For years they have been in my mind, continually thought of and pondered over. I was not more than sixteen when an inner and unclear meaning began to come to me from the entire visible cosmos, and indescribable aspirations filled me. I found them in the grass fields, under the trees, on the hilltops of Tipperary, at sunrise and in the night. There was a deeper meaning everywhere. The sun burned with it, the broad front of morning beamed with it. A deep feeling entered me while gazing at the heavens in the noon and in the starlit evening. I was sensitive to all things, to the earth under, and the star hollowed round about to the least blade of grass to the largest oak. They seemed like exterior nerves and veins for the transport of feeling to me. Sometimes a happiness of beautiful enjoyment of the entire visible cosmos filled me. I was aware that in belief the feeling and the thought were in me and not in the earth or sun, yet I was more aware of it when in company with these. A visit to the sea increased the strength of this imaginative desire. Wow. And so, that's a little glimpse into the writings of James Hayes, and so um, very proud to um, to read those and and share those along. Um, he definitely has a gift for writing, and so um, I'm going to be sharing this along um, on Friends of Ireland. Uh, we have a um, an artist corner discussion board currently going on right now, and I'm probably going to also share them along on YouTube and. Uh, as well as uh, James Hayes Books, which is on Facebook. So I hope you enjoyed those readings. And um, don't be uh, afraid to check out his books. They're really good. And um, uh, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>